everyone. Welcome to our next chapter in our colloquia on scholarly communication in which we are exploring all of these new and emerging ideas, the different new ways in which scholarly knowledge is being produced and disseminated and preserved and evaluated and all of these different things. And we're, of course, in a time of rapid and um, both rapid and major changes in the way in which these things are conducted. So I'm really happy to see all of you here in order to engage in these conversations in American University that are so important. So today, our speaker is one of our own. Stefan Kramer is the data, the research data librarian. He joined us in August after having been in some of the pioneering institutions in this field, such as Cornell and Yale and the German Economic Institute. And we're very happy to have him with us today to talk about research data. So please join me in welcoming him. Thank you for the introduction, Brenda. Can everybody hear me okay in the back? Okay, good. So the topic today is research data in academia, an outlook on preservation, access, reuse, and preservation. And for the first time, I'm using a little thingy that makes the slides advance. The dangerous thing is it also has a laser pointer. So if you see that coming out, then duck. <laughs> so here's the presentation outline for this morning. First, I'll talk about some definitions of what research data is, what we understand by that. Then why research data discoverability and accessibility and preservation matter and how. Then I'll present a model of the research data life cycle and what implications that has for researchers who have to write a data management plan. Um, some challenges of research dissemination and preservation. Then we'll have a brief intermission for questions and answers. And at the right bottom of every slide, okay, you don't see that for some reason. It's cut off, that's not good. Let me try and start this again. I'm going to change the resolution of my computer because otherwise you're not going to see some of this. Okay. Bear with me for a moment. Okay, let's try that. That's better. So at the lower corner of the screen, you'll see a slide number. And during the Q&A session, if you remember what slide number that was, then I can go quickly back to that and we can look at that. So after the intermission, if you will, I'll talk about links in the scholarly ecosystem and some of the ambiguities behind these links and some technologies that can help us resolve them. Then I'll talk about some plans that we have at American University Library for supporting the activities of researchers surrounding data, including a data visualization project that we're starting right now. And then I'll talk about data silos, how universities like ours can be part of the solution, not just part of the problem, but we also are part of the problem, and I'll tell you why. And then we'll have a final Q&A session and after that, we have some libations, which you will all richly deserve after having me listen to me talk for 45 minutes on the first day of spring, when it's nice outside. Um, and I apologize in advance to those in the audience who attended my presentation here last May when I applied for this position, because some of the slides are the same. But if some of those points are still valid 10 months later, then maybe that's a good thing. I want to take a quick poll um, of the audience. How many in the audience are AU students? Okay. How many are AU faculty? Okay. How many are AU staff? How many are not from AU at all? Okay. Good. Some, somebody from everywhere. So, 
what do we mean when we say research data? Here is a definition from our friends down under from the respected Australian National Data Service. And they say providing an authoritative definition of research data is challenging as any definition is likely to depend on the context in which the question is asked. And this is true. And now there you have it. Now on their website they actually have a whole useful compilation of research data definitions from Australian universities. A little closer to us, our friends down the street who fund a lot of the research that is done, say that research data is defined as the recorded factual material that is commonly accepted in the scientific community as necessary to validate research findings. And I think that is really the key. The, valid, the research data is what allows you to validate research findings. And that's what it looks like in clip art. So if you are a researcher reading a piece of scholarly material that asserts something to be the case, and you are wondering, is this really, could this be true? Is this, data, is this right? This doesn't seem right. I want to look up how this, how this conclusion came about based on the data behind it. Then what you need, the research data is what you need access to. And as we all know, research data comes on floppy disks, lots of three and a half inch floppy disks. And I promise you that's the cheesiest and most dated clip art you'll see in this uh, presentation before you head for the exits. So this is. That, that has been the worst, I think. Um, another definition or characterization of research data that I find useful is research data is evidence. It is the evidence behind the claim being made in research. And an important distinction, I think, is that research data is, as I see it, the input to the research process as opposed to the output of the research process, which is typically a publication in the form of a journal article, a conference paper, a dissertation, a book, what have you. And importantly, we should think that we should keep in mind that research data is independent of format. Um, a large number of text documents containing poetry can be research data if you run a computer algorithm across that to detect some patterns in the poetry. That means then you have to have access to those documents again to replicate that research. Images of the universe can be research data if they're used to um, track movements of celestial objects. If you take a single image of the universe, it can be a poster on the wall. And it's not research data, then it's decoration. So it depends on the purpose. Spreadsheets or data files containing the results of a survey or questionnaire can be research data. In this presentation, you'll see a little bit of my own bias here and there. I come from the background of quantitative social sciences, so don't hold that against me. Keep in mind, it can, research data can be many kinds of different things. So what does it matter? Why is it important that research data is discoverable? That means you can find it, accessible, so you can get to it, and preserved. That means that it is still usable after a long period of time. Some of these answers may seem obvious. Um, it's simply because otherwise you cannot find it, you cannot use it, and you cannot repurpose it, and you cannot replicate other studies with it if, not, if all of these conditions are not met. Um, you might say also, if research data cannot be discovered by someone else, then what good is it to have been stored somewhere? If the research data is not as accessible as possible, what good is it that it was discoverable to you? And if it's not well preserved in the future, what good is it that it was made accessible and available? So reusability is really a key here. Um, it, was, it has been said that Geoffrey Bolton of the Royal Society in Britain has said that publishing articles without making the data available is scientific malpractice. That's a strong statement, but that's what he said. And now, now, now more and more journal publishers require um, submitters of manuscripts to put the research data somewhere to be accessible, either on their own systems or to save money so they don't have to do it on the university systems. Um, the availability of research data over time also tends to go from bad to worse, and that is why meeting those conditions is important. Here is a study that was done um, in the life sciences on the availability of research data from 516 publications between 1991 and 2011, so over a course of 20 years. 
And now I'm going to try this laser. Here on this axis, we have, this is the proportion of data confirmed to still be in existence. And down here, we have the years since the publication of the research data. So these researchers found that this was 2013. For even 2011, only 37% of the research data could still be located. And they didn't just go out and look, is it on website? They went as far as trying to email the researcher. Do you have it? Can I have it? If you go to 1991, way back there, it goes down to 7%. So less than 10% of the research data behind these publications could even be located. And that is pretty bad, I think. Of course, in 1991, nobody was talking about this yet, for the most part. Now we will look at a... Um, Oh, sorry. <laughs> the other reason why this is important is because the funders say so. Now, since 2011, the National Science Foundation requires um, all investigators to write a research data management plan with any application. No research data management plan, no money. Suddenly, administrators at universities pay attention to this as well. Um, and the challenging part is this, has all to, this all has to be on two pages, this, this plan. Um, researchers, for the most part, understand we do not like that because any money that has to be put towards research data preservation is money that you don't have to do for the research itself. And we'll talk about that a little later on. And the National Science Foundation has become the model for research data preservation requirements from other federal agencies. The National Endowment of the Humanities has picked this up, for example. And more and more private funders are now requiring research data management preservation in the US as well. And in Europe, this is definitely a requirement across many countries. In the UK, for example, just about every significant funder requires data management planning and data management sharing, uh, data sharing. Here is a model of the research data life cycles. There are many models like this. Some are very complex. Um, this one is more simplified. Um, this is something that two colleagues at Cornell and I put together pretty exactly three years ago. And this is the left half of a poster presentation. We'll look at the other half later on. So in this model, it all begins with the idea in the head of the researcher who, or researchers, could be a group of course, um, where they conceive and plan of a study to be undertaken. Then they select methodologies to collect, to collect and analyze data, how to go about doing this study, and they look for funding sources that they might use, and then actually apply for funding sources if necessary. In the next stage, they look for existing data, so they don't replicate a data collection that has already occurred, which the funding agencies certainly wouldn't like to pay for. And of course, to see if there's any data that is relevant to their study that they might reuse, repurpose, merge with their own data, and so forth. And I have to say this is a somewhat social science quantitative centric model again, sorry. In the next stage, then, um, we go to the design of the research instruments. That could be anything from setting up a lab to launching a satellite to creating a questionnaire. So data are then collected through whatever method was established. And again, it may be that data is also brought in from existing resources, which is why the prior search and discovery stage working well for the researcher is so important. Um, by the way, the research and discovery stage for research data is also something that not just hardcore researchers do, that also brings undergraduate students to the reference desk. They look for, I need data for this paper that I have to do or this class, even if they don't collect their own data after that. And then we go to the analysis and processing or number crunching stage, if you will, where collected data are merged and they're subsetted, cleaned, analyzed, coded, harmonized, linked, massaged, crunched again. And then at the end, and this is not part of the data lifecycle, out of the results of this comes likely a publication. And that's another lifecycle of the publication of the research results. And typically, and that explains the low percentage of available research data, 7% to 37%. This is where the life cycle of research data ended. 
it was on the hard disk of the researcher and then the hard disk got recycled and it was gone. Or the graduate student who did a lot of the work of coding data, crunching the numbers, left. Or it was on a server that has been retired or what have you. And then it's gone. And that should not ideally be the case. So in the ideal continuation of this life cycle, there are three more stages. Um, there is a stage of, a possible stage of publication, which may or may not be separate from archiving. And I'll tell you how they're different. This is data publication. This is not the publication that is based on the data. Um, so this is the activity, for example, of a researcher putting their data set on their own website at the university or one that they have set up themselves, or maybe the journal publisher's website. This is distinguished from archiving because this is not necessarily a long-term preservation. This, I have actually seen this happen. A researcher retires from a major university and on the day they're leaving, he finds out that the university is going to shut down their account. With that account, is, that website is going to disappear. On that website is where they had shared their research data for the last 10 years. Now what? So that's why archiving comes in as a separate life cycle stage. That is the, um, the activity of putting the research data somewhere for long-term preservation. That could be the institutional repository of a university. That could also be a domain repository for that academic discipline. For example, for the social sciences, ICPSR, um, DataNet, um, there's all kinds of institution, uh, domain repositories for different disciplines and some researchers prefer to put their data in a domain repository because it's well known in their domain, others into the university repository, others prefer to put it in both places. And then there is a bridge of metadata, and I'll talk about that in a minute, that leads back to the search and discovery stage. That is how the data archive today can in the future become searchable and discoverable to the next researcher. That might be in a month, a year, or 10 years, or later. The researcher who writes a research data management plan as required by funders up there has to consider this whole life cycle in advance of it happening because they have to write this research data management plan. So they have to write about where, I'm, where am, am I going to share my data at the end of my research? This is not part of this life cycle, but how am I going to back up my data during the five years I'm doing my research? What kind of file formats will I be using during my research? What kind of file formats will I be using when I share my data at the end, which may be more conducive to long-term preservation? Um, who will help me with that? Ideally, they will talk to people at the university who can help them with that and not write into their research data management plan, well, I heard from the IT department that they have servers, so I'll say, I'm gonna put, put my stuff on their servers. And then five years later, or two years after the money from the funding has run out, they go to the IT department and say, I have 15 terabytes of data, got some space for it? Maybe by then it'll be cheap, but now it's not. So that has to be all considered in the research data management plan writing. So metadata and why it's important. Oh, sorry, before that, the, what I call the publication stage of data down here, I heard at a conference three weeks ago a pretty compelling argument that we should no longer speak of data publication. First of all, because it's easily confused with publication of the research results. But also, and that was the argument there, Publication in the mind of an academic researcher has a pretty high standard of quality control, peer review, and such things. And that is typically not the case in data publication. You put it out on a repository, you describe it well, you document it well, but that does not live up to the term publication in the academic sense. So if I keep saying publication for the rest of this um, presentation, take that as meaning sharing. So why is metadata so important in the discoverability of research data? There are several reasons for that. Um, unlike text documents, which a search engine like Google can crawl and index the text and then make searchable based on that text, data file formats are often binary, binary and proprietary in their nature. 
so they cannot be full text indexed. This, this example here is a screen snapshot of an SPSS um, data file. Even if one could full text index such a data file, which you cannot, it wouldn't make much sense because what's in there, there's nothing descriptive in there. There are column numbers, uh, columns here that probably refer to the number in a questionnaire. That doesn't tell you anything without the questionnaire. In the data itself, there are various numbers. For some of these columns, they might be the actual value, age, height, what have you. In others, it might be a code. One is male, two is female. But you have no idea of knowing that without some documentation, which may be located in external files. Um, any Stata users here? Use of Stata? No? OK. Well, uh, so there are multiple um, data analysis systems where you have the data in one file, the raw data in one file, and then in another file, you have the description of the data and the code to run the analysis. So you need, you need at least those two together to even make sense of the data. So they both have to be preserved together. And so because of that being the case, that's why good metadata is important as a subset of data documentation. Data documentation, which the researcher would have to produce because they know the data, is vital for the, reu the reusability of the data in the future. Otherwise, it cannot be understood independently by another researcher. And independently means you don't have to go back to the original researcher and ask because they may be dead or moved or retired or can't be found or don't respond to email. Um, and good metadata is crucial for data discoverability. And I'll talk about how, why a little bit later on. And the question now becomes, in the life cycle of the data, who is going to take care of all this, this metadata creation? And that, those are discussions that are being had at many universities at this time. Um, some of it makes sense for the researchers to do. Some of it makes sense for the uh, maintainers of data archives to do. And they have to work ideally hand in hand across this data life cycle and not think about how this should work at the very end. Now some challenges in research data dissemination. One, that's one of the elephants in the room. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, it's great to share a lot of data, but in some fields, such as environmental science, um, disciplines dealing with endangered species, for example, and certainly with human subjects. There is a lot of um, private, confidential, and sensitive information, and that should not be inappropriately released. And that means not just removing that from the data that's being shared, but also thinking about if this data here could be combined with other data sets out there, what might be disclosed. And for that to be avoided, universities and other research um, Organizations have to develop and deploy clear and easy to use policies and tools for the researchers and also have assistance for researchers who are not versed in these areas um, to help them with if, they, if and when they want to publish or share their data. For example, having consultants who know something about stati statistical disclosure control, who know what do you have to do to data to make it anonymous and to make it not discoverable that this this row here is that individual, because I can put two and two together and say, aha, if somebody has this income and lives in that area, it must be this person. Or even have a reasonable chance of guessing at that. That should not be possible. Now let's talk about a problem in the, the academic reward system as it stands now, and something that I pretty recently heard about is really now hap happening, the emergence of the data paper. As it stands now in academia, there are few instances where a researcher gets rewarded with tenure or promotion because they have taken it upon themselves to publish or to share their data and make sure it gets archived. Um, Christine Borgman of UCLA has done some research with deans and provosts and so on, and in the end, most of them say there's not a snowball's chance in hell that my faculty members here will get any credit for doing that. Because we want to see publications in peer-reviewed journals of high reputation. That's what counts. So in steps, the publisher, this is from Nature, 
Nature Publishing will come out with a new publication called Scientific Data in May. And this will contain data papers. And these papers will be nothing more and nothing less than good peer-reviewed descriptions of research data sets. Now, you could say, that's great. Um, that works again for the academic reward system because now you're back to something that the system recognizes. Aha, this researcher has described their data in a paper, it's in a publication, it's peer-reviewed, it's from nature, great. What's to me a little bit disturbing about that from the university point of view is that once again the publishers will step into the system of scholarly information dissemination and make money off the process in part because the current system of rewards in academia is so conservative. We'll see how successful they are. I have, I have not looked up what they'll be charging per paper. It's an open access journal, so I think they, it means they will charge the author by the paper. And that tends to run in the hundreds to thousands per um, publication. I haven't looked at this one, but nature is probably not going to be the cheapest. Um, for successful archiving of data, at the risk of stating the obvious, buy-in from the researcher is important. They have to be willing to do this and they have to participate in the process. Obviously, it's their data. And it's not enough to deposit the data itself, as I said before, but also all the documentation that is necessary for others to understand and reuse the data. I think I'm belaboring that point. And this is another take on that same point. It's necessary to share data but not sufficient for um, future reuse. This is a statement from Michael Nielsen who says essentially that if data is poorly documented then it's not going to be useful to somebody else. Um, if a researcher takes the lowest path of resistance and just puts the data up on a website, the raw data itself, and says here go for it, I have done my part, then that's not going to be sufficient for somebody else in the future to take the data and do something useful with it. Um, there are, however, now services that make that somewhat appealing and tempting, perhaps, such as Figshare, um, others where it's easy to say, oh, I'll create an account, and up it goes, and my data is now published. Um, what will happen if Figshare gets bought out by somebody else? What will happen if that somebody else decides to get out of that business? Some of you may recall a few years ago, Google, maybe five years ago, Google said to people, upload your research data to us. We'll have a new service for research data. And we have lots of disk space. And one year later, they pulled the plug. And they said, with about two months notice, if you have any data here, please take it down. We're discontinuing the service. This was a Google lab or Google beta project. And that could happen to just about anyone. Um, challenges of research data preservation. So one might ask, okay, well, we're not gonna just trust Figshare or our own department's website because it may go away or change, but won't the journal publishers take care of research data preservation? If it's them who offer me, the researcher, to upload my data to them or they even require me to do that. In economics, for example, it's almost commonplace now that publishers require um, research data to be made available with the publication. There was a survey done of 134 scientific publishers. This is now three years ago. And you can see there on the left side that of the smaller publishers, um, almost 60% said, yes, we will let researchers submit their research data to us. And of the larger publishers, over 70% said that. Now, before I go to the next graph, I'll have a audience quiz. Um, the next, qu another question they asked of the same 134 publishers was, do you have arrangements in place to preserve the research data that researchers will submit to you? Any guesses of what percentage of publishers said yes, they have such arrangements? Zero, I had zero. Ten. Ten, okay. It's actually better than that, I should, <laughs> but it's still not great. 70% said they have no preservation arrangements. That means 30% said they have some arrangement or other. However, that arrangement could also be 
we're going to ask the researcher to put their data somewhere else and then we'll link to it. That way we don't have to do anything. So the, in short, fair enough, this is from 2011, but the, the journal publishers are not necessarily the entity in this ecosystem to count on preserving the research data for a long, long time. Another elephant in the room, this is about research data preservation still over the long term, years to decades. Who will curate already archived research data? It will be, have to be done by whoever maintains the data archive, the data repository. And that's going to cost money and that's going to take resources and how many it's going to take and who's going to deploy them is still an ongoing discussion because we don't really know yet. There are some formulas, somebody at Princeton developed a formula, if you charge for a researcher twice what it costs to store the data today, double that price, then that will last forever because the, the, the price of storage declines and so that will be enough. Of course, we don't know server farms, for example, take a lot of electricity, and so this is really an unknown entity. Here is a quiz for the audience. So let's take the example of a text document. Keep in mind a research data archive would be in charge of preserving all kinds of file types, um, anything from SPSS to video files to audio files, but like, let's take the case of a text document. What would you say, in your opinion, is today the best file format for preserving a text document for the long term? Any taker? XML, XML? That's, that's good. Another one? If you had a, a paper of some sort, and you were creating it in LaTeX or Word or Notepad, but you wanted to preserve that in another format? Yeah, I would say, I, that's what I was going to say, PDF, I think. Uh, there's a PDF slash A, which means archival format, which is means you cannot change the document anymore, but in a sense that's the idea because um, you wouldn't want to for an archive document. XML would be great because that's a text file format for a type of data, so for example, um, in a where I worked before, we've gotten X, uh, Excel files to be archived and converted them to XML because you can do that, so you're out of the proprietary, proprietary Excel format. Now, if you had asked this question, what, what did I just asked, 15 years ago or 20 years ago on a university campus, I think the answer you would have probably gotten is not PDF. You, people would have said, of course, you would create an Adobe PostScript file because everybody has a PostScript printer. And if you don't have a PostScript printer, of course you're gonna have software like GhostScript, which can read PostScript files and display them on your screen. And I would challenge you today to go out into this building or on the quad and in five minutes find three people who know what a PostScript file is. Well, that's not fair, okay. Maybe in one minute. Depends how many people you find or who it is or how old they are. Um, but that the point here is that what is regarded as the obvious choice for a file format to preserve, even that changes over time. That means data archives have to be after that all the time. They cannot just they can't just park data somewhere and forget about it. And the other challenge is money, really. This is from a white paper from the Inter-University Consortium for Political and Social Research, which runs probably the world's largest and one of the oldest, if not the oldest, data archive. And they have made the point that domain repositories, such as them, face a problem in that they are not adequately funded to deal with the ever-growing volume of data that they will have to accommodate as part of university open access mandates, as part of the requirements from funding agencies, and so on. And they don't just have to take in the data, but as we just discussed, they have to do something with the data over time, a curation process. And the current model of funding research is such that the research will be done and will be funded for a certain time period and there's no money set aside for doing anything with the data in the future. So some, something has to happen with those models. And that means, I think, that some lobbying of the people down the road has to be done by academia, by research institution in order to 
change that because it's not it's, that is a problem for domain repositories, but it's also a problem for university repositories, um, no matter what the size of the university is. All right, now I'll take a brief intermission for any questions or comments on these things. Don't be shy. Yes, Mana. So they have, they have done one thing, and now they find themselves in a corner with another thing. They have started two years ago requiring research data management plans. Sure. So they have, and they say, we want researchers to share their data. What they have not done is put any money behind it, because it has to come out of the re same research fund that the researcher gets. Um, now, I will, a little later, I'll be talking about the Research Data Alliance at Gatherings like that, NSF officers are now saying to researchers, please tell us what needs to be done next, because we don't know. Um, and that's, I think that's happening right now. So that's, that's a good thing. It's a little, it would be, have been nice if they had thought about the whole thing from the get-go. And I think the other thing that's, um, at the conference that I was, in, there was the International Data Curation Conference three weeks ago. Clif Clifford Lynch, who always gives a good keynote, said that he thinks, and I think he's right, in about five to ten years, we'll be seeing a real big problem with this whole research data business because in that time, that's the time when a lot of big research will have finished for which researchers wrote research data management plans five years ago at that point. Will the NSF, will their reviewers then go back literally to those research data management plans and check off which of those things has been done? And if not, who has to fix it? Because if the, if, the, you know, if, the if the research is near its end and the researcher has produced no metadata and the file formats are all proprietary and there has been no thought given to where it's going to go, in what format, then the reviewer is going to say, well, this is all wrong, take some money back, or I don't know what. But that's all, that process has also not been established. Mary. Stefan, this is a rather large question that you may want to hold till the end. But it, I, I'm making an assumption, and that's my first question, is this assumption true? That the private sector, the profit-making sector, has probably solved a lot of these problems about archiving and setting up who knows what kind of metadata and access for themselves. And I'm thinking about those large companies that collect lots and lots of data about each of us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That inevitable um, compilation that's going on. Um, and of course, they have far more money to invest. But um, is that going to carry over to libraries at all? Are there uh, ways in which we could tap to that? I would say hopefully yes. Um, I, have, um, I have poked around LinkedIn quite a bit and I happened upon a group on LinkedIn which, has, which is called Metadata and Metadata Quality. And I thought, oh, that sounds interesting. I wonder if this is information scientists and library people. And it turns out it was all people who work for corporations and take care of their data, which is often you know, confidential data or data that they want to keep for themselves, but they have processes in place to make sure that when the CEO looks for some data from this time about this and this thing, they can find it quickly. Or the salesperson in the field. Um, has there been much discussion between academic and research sector metadata people and them? Not that I know of. I have never seen them together at the same conference. Now there is, again, this research data alliance that I mentioned, they're starting, it's starting to show up that these people are also there and they're trying to, discussions are beginning. Um, I think there will be on both sides some cultural differences to overcome in, internally that universities might say, okay, we're willing to ad adopt this 
process this standard from this and this um, company. Or I can also see that companies will be developing and offering for fee services and hosting and so on that universities will buy into rather than trying to do it for themselves, especially smaller universities for which that doesn't scale or is not workable. So that's very that's a very good question. I think so. I think the answer is hopefully these things will come together more than they have. Yes. Um, thank you. This has been really uh, helpful to see this kind of overview at the five thousand foot level, if you will. But um, I'm wondering about the uh, stability of the electronic environment for long term preservation, fifty mm -hmm. years, a hundred years. Do we have any idea uh, about how stable this is likely to be? Uh, without continual built-in refreshment along the way? I think the short answer would be, of course we don't, because we haven't, we've, only start, we've only begun to do this at all, so we cannot look back to anything that has been done in the past to really say what happens over a really, really long-term process. We have some experience based on digital documents that goes back now 20, maybe 30 years. Um, the archival community, so I'm not an archivist by training, but the archival and digital archival community is very heavily investigating, looking into and developing ways to transfer files from one format to another, to have metadata that describes the content, but also the format of files so we can understand what they are independent of the files themselves. It gets very, it gets very technical. And at near the end of what AU is doing, there are platforms being developed that are conducive and flexible enough to host all kinds of different digital assets, research data, other types of documents, and so on. But the real answer is, we, for sure, we, don't, we really don't know yet. How, we're going to see, for those of us who are still around in, th in a couple of decades, 50 years, we'll see what will have happened. But I, I would guess there will still be questions what, of the same nature. What was a postscript file? What was a postscript file? Or what, what was a smartphone? Why, or, you know, that kind of thing. Did, why, did, why did people have keyboards? Yes. So that was an interesting comment you talk about postscript because I remember when I was writing my thesis, I used Warstar. And nobody knows what that is. Yeah. How did this fit into the cycle of activities and where would you, because I have experience with faculties, they don't care. Mm -hmm. They just want to give you the data. Yeah. So then at that, some point, somebody's going to have to enter something. So it is from your experience, where do that, who's the responsibility where that come in, for, for example. Mm -hmm. and, um, and how, as I, uh, I'm on the list for the Metadata Group or RDA Alliance, and because the, the vast format of the data that we are dealing with, there are so many different types of metadata that need to go in to describe these things. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so, where, or how does one expect a metadata person who uh, their primary job is providing this whole of description to really know that I should know more about Geno metadata mm -hmm. versus geospatial metadata, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. I would say the answer to that is, and it's not a complete one, is that the metadata person has to be, in, as part of that training, an ongoing training, should be involved and be dealing with researchers not just near the end of this life cycle, but up here, and perhaps be involved with them in part, as part of the research process in order to help the researchers generate metadata at several points during the course of the research, not at the very end. That's a, that's a very short and incomplete answer, but remind me to return to this at the end because I'll, talk, I'll be talking next about some other metadata elements that I think sort of relate to that. In the scholarly ecosystem, we have several players. We have the researcher, 
doing the research, who creates data sets and puts them somewhere, hopefully, and creates publications based on analysis of such data with the help of a publisher very often. I'll leave the money out of that for now. We have the researcher's university or agency or what have you who employs the researcher and we have people who fund the research. And this is all linked together in various ways. The funding agency, for example, wants to know what publications and data sets have been generated from the research that we have funded. The researcher would like to know how can I list and cite my publications and the data sets and my funding sources. The university would like to know what has this researcher published in terms of research productivity for promotion, for tenure, etc. What do we need to do to accommodate this researcher's data output? Hopefully they will be asking what do we do about this. Um, others outside of this picture will ask how can I find the data set or the data sets that inform the findings in the publication that I found. Or, on the other hand, if I found the data set first, how can I find out what publications were based on that? So there are lots of questions behind this. And behind these links in this ecosystem are several assertions that are being made. And these assertions have an underlying ambiguity that can, I think, be to some extent resolved. And those are funding sources, data sources, and authorship. So here this is about funding sources. I don't mean to pick on these people. This is just an example. So they say research was funded by this and that agency, or the money came from this place. Now, if you're later on trying to link the research output back to the source of the funding, this will be difficult to be the link, because this just tells you a particular agency. And it may even be a sort of ephemeral place. Is this an agency? How long is this going to be around? You don't really know. Um, so that's going to be a link that could break based on just the name of an agency or funder. Here's the case of data sources. I was very lucky to find this, but I thought it was an amazing example. At the beginning, it's very vague. They say, we're using data from a preschool enrollment through service of state preschool administrators. It doesn't say what surveys. Did they do the surveys? Did they get the data somewhere else or what? Um, then that gets more specific. Then they say we use um, from a particular program. That may make it more easy to find. And then it gets best. And then they say we actually use data from this source, from this state, from this table, and that gets pretty good. That's pretty good data citation, if you will. And next, authorship. I think this is the most challenging part. So this is a typical bibliography that you find in a research publication um, in the typical format prescribed by APA or others. And here's the problem. How can you know whether Langston, Tyler, Lindsay, Cummings, Johnson, etc., are the same or different people from other people with the same last name that may be listed elsewhere? They could be the same, they could be different. Or is Lindsay, comma, E, B the same as somebody who might somewhere else be Lindsay, just comma, E? What if the author changes their name due to marriage? They, then it's all lost. What if the author uses different character sets to publish in different places? So is this the same person as this? Um, there are examples of researchers from Scandinavia who have 16 different ways to spell their name, not counting just <laughs> abbreviations with the little O's with slashes through them and so forth. So just based on names, the linkage between researchers' identity and their output, their publication, their research data can very easily break. If you just try to use names as linking these pieces of the ecosystem together that I showed before. And there are some potential solutions for resolving these ambiguities. One is the well-known digital object identifier, which can be applied to data and publications. Already familiar to researchers, because it's assigned to most journal articles nowadays. And here at AU, we're going to look in using data site as a provider of digital object identifiers for data sets that researchers can then use to attach to data sets. 
for researchers and research contributors, such as graduate assistants, there's the Open Researcher and Contributor Identifier, or ORCID. And we will be looking here into certainly educating researchers about ORCID, but possibly also providing services to generate ORCIDs for them. For funding sources, there's a really recent development, FundREF, um, which is going to disambiguate what I showed earlier about funding agencies and funding sources by actually having specific codes for them which then can be linked to or from research output and researchers. So I should hurry up here. So what plans do we have here for supporting researchers' data-related activities? Um, the first thing is to conduct a survey of researchers on their support needs. That obviously makes sense to do, and that's what I hope to have finished by the end of the spring semester. I haven't started it yet, but I hope to end it by then. <laughs> um, we'll set up a lab where faculty can work with a full-time GIS analyst on projects that require or could make use of geospatial information tools. Um, and this analyst will assist the researchers, will develop and deploy platforms for geospatial information, will identify, acquire, and document data, geospatial data sets, and so forth. Um, there is something called the Data Management Planning Tool, DMP tool, an online tool that we already have in place to create data management plans, but it's not customized to a specific environment, and that's something I hope to do by the end of the summer, being optimistic, maybe a little later. Um, that could be me, because I have elbow patches, as you can see, <laughs> but I don't have that much hair, so. so it's somebody else. So we'll offer workshops for faculty and graduate students on all these topics of research data management, using GIS in research for research, ORCIDs, creating ORCIDs, creating DOIs, and so forth. So this series of a bunch of workshops to be developed, I think, in the fall semester, maybe starting already by the end of the fall semester, if it all goes well. Further down the road, when this building gets renovated, which is being planned, we want to set up two separate rooms, and they definitely have to be separate. One is for researchers to work with restricted use data sets, that is data containing confidential elements where the data provider, such as Bureau of Labor Statistics or National Center for Education Statistics, has certain requirements for keeping the data safe. That means a graduate student cannot just get it and put it on their laptop and ride around on the metro with it and so forth. It has to be in a very secure facility that's locked up and locked up and locked up again and the computer is locked up and it's not on the internet and the computer itself is locked up and the data is locked up and the researcher gets handcuffed, no. <laughs> but it has, there are, these agencies have strict requirements for what that has to look like and so we want to set that up here in the library because most graduate students don't have that unless their department has a place like that and many researchers don't have that. And then secondly, um, a room for data group work by students using data visualization tools. So that in a group they can visualize data in some way or other, which may be the future method, first method of data analysis and data exploration. Going on, this is about data archiving. So we're planning on most likely using Islandora to, as a platform to create a long-term archival repository for any kind of digital object and that should be flexible and extensible enough for research data. Um, for those who have heard of these platforms, um, Islandora is based on Fedora which is a very open flexible back-end storage system and Drupal which is a content management system as the front-end. So Drupal sits on top of Fedora and that makes Islandora. That means because Fedora is in the back end, we could select or invent or develop other front ends that sit on top of that uh, that are specifically conducive for research data discovery and interaction with research data. Next, um, let's see if this works. We have a listing of online library databases at AU. We have a couple of hundred of those. You may have, some of you may have seen this. And 
They are identified now in some ways by these icons. That means this has full text and this is mobile friendly. And I just completed an inventory of all of these databases to see, because it's of interest to students, which of these have downloadable numeric data. And we will identify those with another icon so that the researcher can look at these databases and say, aha, this one and this one, this one has it. And I found that 72 have it, which is more than I expected. 72 out of, I think, 400 or so. Does anybody? Yeah. OK. Um, moving right along. And in terms of organization, I hope this summer we will launch a research data management group here on campus, which will improve communication, coordination, information exchange around resources and services behind research data across this life cycle, because we have various units on campus who support this in some way or other at different stages. And the idea here is that we'll get together, coordinate better what we do, so the handover around this life cycle works best for the researcher. And the structure of that is inspired by the Research Data Management Service Group at Cornell University. And we currently have, starting practically now, a visualization pilot project using the Socrata Open Data Portal. This is at the publication stage of research. And I would say that data visualization might be a very good way of data publication or data sharing. Because, sure, a researcher can put up their data set and say, well, somebody else can go and download it. That requires that, that somebody else know what to do with the data set they downloaded. And they have to have software to analyze it with. And students and faculty at universities have that, but many others don't. So, for example, journalists, policy makers down there in Capitol Hill, citizens might be willing and able to interact with data on the web. I'm talking research data from faculty. Rather than just, they wouldn't download it, they wouldn't know what to do with it to, when they have to download it, but they can do something with it if it's online. So for that, per, and in a sense, to, we talk about having more research impact on this campus a lot in various forums. And I would argue that just broadening the audience to the research data adds some research impact. And the platform we have selected for this pilot is the Socrata Open Data Portal, which has been used for some time by government agencies to comply with open data requirements from their legislatures or just because it's a good thing to open up the data from government agencies. So this has been used by city governments, county governments, state governments, country governments, and we're going to try out how well this works for an academic environment. And this is being built as we speak to um, have ready, I think, week after next to put the first data sets into it. Um, and for this to work, we need participation from faculty. So if you are a faculty member willing to try out data that you have in this platform, or you know somebody who might be willing to do that, please talk to me. Because um, the, the, the test of the pilot project, the test is, well, is, is it good for visualizing data? It's also, is it how workable is it in, as a system to administer and so forth? But it doesn't work without having data. <coughs> and this will be at datapilot.american.edu when ready pretty soon. Okay, I'm running a bit short on time here, so I'll speed this up. Um, data silos. So this is about two and a half year old slide, reused with apologies. So at university departments, we are in some way contributing, contributing to this problem. I am contributing to this problem. I just told you we're going to have a separate Islandora data archive for the long term, and we're going to have a visualization platform here. For the moment, that's unavoidable. And that's what I think happens at many places. So that these, plat these silos are being built left and right. And this will become more complex over time as the amount of data grows. So what's the answer to that? That is for universities, for um, commercial entities, as Mary Mintz brought up, for 
um, universities, external repositories, researcher systems, researcher systems, etc., to work towards the interoperability of that research data so that it can be passed from one stage of the life cycle to another as easily as possible and can be discovered, can be described, and so forth. Um, part of that could also be for universities, if they're going through the trouble to create metadata for the research data anyway, to talk to search engine developers how they can utilize the, dis the metadata that we create. Because where do, where do students go first when they start their research? It's probably Google or something like that. And it would be nice if Google were up to help us with that. So over the past couple of years, colleagues of mine and I have talked to Wolfram Alpha, to Google, to Microsoft Research about this issue. And I won't say who said what, but the answers were, well, we don't really want to do that because we want to have the data. We don't, have, we don't want to be it out there and then make it discoverable. Or this is really too difficult. We don't want to do that. Or we're really more focused on the um, publicly appealing sector, this research data stuff, who, who's, who wants to see that? So I think in some ways we'll have to keep, academia and research will have to keep pushing those folks in our direction if we want research data to be discoverable through the methods that many people will start the search with to begin with. Um, American University Library has applied to become an organizational member of the Research Data Alliance. Anybody as an individual can join for free. That's important to say, um, especially for developing countries researchers. This has been funded to begin with by the Australian government, by the European Commission and by the US National Science Foundation and by the National Institute for Science Standards and Technology, sorry. So they have provided funding to launch this, but funding will be needed to keep this going, and that's where organizational members come in. And as one of the founders of that entity, RDA, has said it's, it's about having some skin in the game. If we're talking about making data interoperable and all those things, then we should put something behind that, and not just expect somebody else to do it. And this is, RDA is different from other professional associations in that they actually have working groups and interest groups with very specific charges that go through a process of being approved and then in a time period of 12 to 18 months are expected to produce something useful. Code, software, documentation, best practices, standards, and what have you. And that is it. So I thank you for your time and attention and if you go to that website here you can find the future events of the American University Library Consortium and recordings of presentations including this one and if you have any follow-up questions you can email me here, uh oh the laser's out, or talk to me now. Thank you very much.